Crossroads Environmental and Food Politics under the Bolsonaro regime. We're so glad you're here. This is our first um, session in a three-part series. We have two more speakers, March 10th and March 31st. So today we're joined by Dr. Hannah Whitman, who I'll let my colleague Jennifer Blesch tell you more about. Um, on the March 10th, we'll have Dr. Gustavo Oliveira, Oliveira join us. And then on March 31st, Dr. Susana Hetch join us. So a couple, a couple things about who is here, who's organizing this, and then we'll pass it off to our speaker. So I work with a group called the University of Michigan Sustainable Food Systems Initiative on campus. We have over 70 affiliated faculty and staff, and this is a group who researches and teaches about food systems from all different disciplinary angles. We offer, we have an undergraduate minor, we have a graduate certificate in sustainable food systems. We have all kinds of food systems coursework across campus. We offer a brand new TFS fellowship, which will be kicking off in the fall. And we also have a class some of you may be familiar with called Food Literacy for All. You're welcome to join us for this open to the public speaker series, which takes place every Tuesday evening during the winter semester. So if you Google Food Literacy for All, you can find more about it. We can drop a link in the chat. Next week, in particular, our, um, Dr. Priya Fielding Singh will be joining us on Tuesday night. Please join us. Okay, so we, we're just curious who is joining us. If you can type in the chat, where are you tuning in from? We're, we'd love to see who is here. And also, if you are, feel like sharing, what brings you? Or who are you? Are you an agroecologist? Are you tuning in from Brazil? Are you a researcher studying these topics? Are you a student, interested, grandparent? We wanna just say, share whatever you wish. It's just nice to have a sense of who is here. And I also want to say that this speaker series is it's really a three part collaboration um, between my group, the Sustainable Food Systems Initiative. And we're so pleased to be working with LAXIS, which is the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies here, and also the School for Environment and Sustainability. So this is the team that has brought you together. And I think we've got enough folks here, critical mass. So I will pass this off to Jennifer Blesch. Hey, thanks, Lily. Welcome, everyone. I'm thrilled to introduce Hannah Whitman today. Hannah's become a close collaborator over the past 10 years or so, contributing really substantially to my journey in thinking as an interdisciplinary food systems scholar and agroecologist. She received her PhD in development sociology from Cornell University, and she's a professor in the Institute of Resources, Environment, and Sustainability and the Faculty of Land and Food Systems at the University of British Columbia. She leads UBC's Research Excellence Cluster in Diversified Agroecosystems and served as Academic Director of the Center for Sustainable Food Systems at UBC Farm from 2015 to 2020. She's co-specialty chief editor of the Social Movements, Institutions, and Governance section of the journal Frontiers in Sustainable Food Systems, and she's on the editorial board of Agronomy for Sustainable Development. Hannah has several influential edited books, including two on food sovereignty and another titled Environment and Citizenship in Latin America, Nature's Strug Subjects and Struggles. Her interdisciplinary research uses participatory action and transdisciplinary methods to identify pathways towards food sovereignty, agrarian reform, agroecology, and health equity in Canada and Latin America. Through these methods, she conducts engaged scholarship that can inform policy and practices that help support more sustainable and resilient food systems. So thank you so much for joining us today, Hannah. We're delighted to have you kick off this mini series focused on food systems and the environment in Brazil. And I'm gonna hand the Zoom floor over to you. Thank you so much, Jen. And thank you for the invitation. We were, um, I'm so sorry I can't be with you in person. Um, it's been quite a few years since I've been to University of Michigan, but um, I've had the chance to engage with Jennifer and Leslie and Annalise and lots of University of Michigan folks and research projects over the years. So I hope to come in person at some point soon when we get through this kind of travel ban. I do have to say I'm going back to Brazil on March 1st for the first time since the pandemic. So I'm very, very excited about that. So um, I was invited by Jen to kind of talk a little bit about the work that we're doing in Brazil. Um, particularly on agroecological transitions. And I thought for this interdisciplinary audience, um, we could uh, first 
start with the land acknowledgement that um, that we we carry out here in British Columbia and that many people carry out now as, as, as part of acknowledging where I'm I'm speaking to you from. I'm not speaking to you from Brazil. I'm speaking to you from the traditional <clears throat> ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish First Nations here in uh, Western, what is now known as Canada. And in, in this space, and similar to many of the spaces that I work in in Brazil, agriculture, as, as we mostly see it, is not, it's not a good thing. It's a colonial imposition that is violently erased. Many Indigenous people and places, not just here, but across, and not just in Brazil, and not just in Michigan, but across many other global spaces of dispossession and colonization. So working here, and especially in the work that I've done at the UBC Farm, has encouraged me to rethink the ways of approaching my research and my teaching to honor and support the diverse ways that food is cultivated, consumed, and conceptualized in practice and in policy. So agroecological transitions in Brazil are, are super challenged by inequitable access to land, given those historical dynamics, um, contested policies about how to feed the world while cooling the planet, and really high levels of uncertainty on how, how to adapt to changing markets, consumer dietary preferences, climate change, so using out examples from participatory research on what is now becoming digital agroecological certification in Brazil, um, I'm gonna share with you some of our work that aims to highlight and make space for more diverse, equitable and sustainable agroecological landscapes with the ultimate aim to, to have greater political recognition of agroecology and to support the emerging solidarity networks between rural and urban communities. So at a global scale, decades after the Green Revolution, almost a billion people remain undernourished and our food system exacerbates climate change and biodiversity loss. Agricultural pesticides create health hazards for farm workers and consumers. Synthetic fertilizers are responsible for water contamination and threatening soil biology. We also confront a problem of democracy and governance. Economic concentration in the global agri-food system has led to a very, very small set of decision makers who exert enormous influence over markets, seeds, agricultural inputs, and agricultural and land use policy. So these facts speak to a confluence of crisis that characterize what we call a wicked set of intellect, social, and ecological problems facing society. It is clear that action is urgently needed to solve these challenges, <clears throat> but translating diverse ways of knowing about agroecology into action remains a major challenge for researchers, policymakers, and for farmers themselves. So in approaching the topic of agroecosystem change and looking at agroecological transitions as resistance rather than just a set of practices, looking at agroecology as a lever of change beyond simply um, an alternative way of producing food, we can look at the ways in which the dynamics of power and access to land and different kinds of knowledge structure the evolution of our global, local, and regional food systems. So as an intern and transdisciplinary food system scholar, I work with a large team of grassroots actors, as well as researchers from the field of sociology, ecology, agronomy, computer science, public policy, many other fields. It's actually really fun. So integrating these, what we try to do is we try to integrate really diverse ontologies or, or ways of, of even thinking about what the world is um, through what we call epistemological pluralism. So looking at different ways of knowing about what the world is. And then we subsequently engage in the co-cultivation of research questions at the grassroots, um, which then helps us approach the idea of research with actionable influence. So kind of in a nutshell, that's our approach to transdisciplinary research. And using the principles of, epistem of epistemological pluralism, that is acknowledging, learning, and learning about and integrating different ways of knowing about agriculture from the perspective of both kind of Western science and social movements themselves, um, my work aims to bring together insights from these really diverse methods of data collection. So qualitative narrative, storytelling, quantitative surveys, field sampling, remote sensing, and other big data approaches. And together with all of our collaborators, we try to develop kind of a more nuanced and inclusive view of agri-ecosystem patterns and processes across scales, 
We're developing new monitoring protocols and standards that can handle this kind of ontological diversity using new, new shared languages, and ultimately to advance data solutions for <clears throat> data-driven solutions for sustainable agriculture. So generally we put our acknowledgements at the end, but I thought it's really important up front because this is such an interdisciplinary space to put my uh, acknowledgements uh, front and center. Um, I've worked on issues related to agroecological transition uh, in Brazil for over two decades, but during the last two years, my work has taken a very different rhythm. I haven't been able to go to Brazil. Um, I have had some students in Brazil, but really I wanna acknowledge up front my privilege to collaborate with a really wide network of students, farmer researchers, and farmer organizations in Brazil. Um, I also wanna acknowledge uh, my grad students from the UBC Food Sovereignty Lab, um, particularly some um, members from Sapagro, which is a Brazilian NGO that I'll talk about that I've been working quite closely with this last few years. And then um, today also my University of Michigan co-authors and collaborators, Jennifer uh, Annalise Stratton, who I noticed is here in the room with us, and also Vivian Valencia, who's Jen's postdoc for a couple of years, who did a lot of work on <coughs> agroecology and public procurement in Brazil. So it's been really actually a privilege the last couple of years to see this work continue and I've been able to kind of witness it through a zoom screen um, so I'm really excited to go back to Brazil in just a couple weeks and and see my friends in person so a little bit about the broader project that I'll kind of talk about quite a bit today so since 2018 I've been involved in an action research project that was initiated by the Brazilian agroecological NGO uh, Sapagro which is um, uh, uh, kind of an NGO that has worked on transitions to sustainable agriculture and agroecology for over 30 years. It's, it's centered in the state of Santa Catarina in southern Brazil. And Sapagro is part of the Brazilian Ecovida uh, Network for Participatory Agroecological Certification. I'll say more about that later too. And also coordinates an international community of practice around agroecological transitions and participatory certification. So in early 2020, we launched a project to coordinate the development of a digital solution for tracking agroecological indicators to support this community of practice. And we're currently pilot piloting digital agroecological indicator methodologies with seven organizations in Latin America, three in Brazil, one in Paraguay, one in Ecuador, one in Mexico, and one in El Salvador. And so much of what I'll share with you today uh, emerges from the engagement I've had with these organizations, and especially the three Brazilian organizations over the last three years. So particularly, I'm gonna focus on the socio-political context in which agroecological transitions are occurring in Brazil. So here's a little outline of, of some kind of topics we'll walk through in the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, talk about uh, divergent pathways in an agro-environmental state. We're gonna take uh, so a minute to look backwards at how the governance of land and food resources has shaped Brazilian economic, social, and ecological possibilities. We're going to look at social movement mobilization for food sovereignty and agroecological transitions. We'll highlight the kind of heyday of social movement success in beginning to institutionalize support for agroecology and food sovereignty mechanisms within the public uh, Brazilian public policy context, kind of from the mid 2000s to the mid 2010s. Then look at the limits and challenges to this FOME Zero platform and kind of a dive into political retrenchment and the resurgence. Well, not really the resurgence of agribusiness power, but the um, complete takeover, I guess, of the state by agribusiness power. You can debate that too quite a bit in the question and answer period. And then moving on, we'll kind of dig into one example of how Sapagro's grassroots network is working with a citizen science and policy advocacy model by building agroecological networks that connect uh, people in, in the city and in the countryside. And I'll conclude by examining the prospects for agroecology as both conceptual and practical resistance, uh, providing a foundation for feeding people in a time of crisis. So when we think about contemporary measures for agroecology as resistance in Brazil, we must acknowledge the contradictions inherent in agroecological mobilization on unceded indigenous territory. Today, Brazil has one of the highest rates of land inequality in the world. The largest 10% of landowners own 73% of agricultural land. And this inequality is part of the continued legacy of the colonial period, the dispossession of indigenous lands, peoples, food systems, and ways of knowing 
<clears throat> in service of industrial large scale monocultures grown primarily for export. So as in many colonial contexts, land consolidation and dispossession has resulted in significant environmental consequences, uh, as well as the social ones. So for example, natural vegetation cover in the 10 kilometer um, radius outside of indigenous reserves across Brazil has been reduced by about half. This both reflects the increasing encroachment of extractive industries, particularly industrial agriculture on diversified landscapes across Brazil, but it also highlights the importance of um, indigenous control of territory um, as they're able to kind of protect their land for their own socio-ecological resi uh, resilience. So this is kind of a, a really big challenge when you now see these islands of, of, of territory surrounded by agribusiness and um, these border edges are increasingly war zones where um, industrial agriculture is encroaching more and more and more on indigenous land, um, whether it's demarcated or not. So as a campaign platform, um, so and also um, Amazonian deforestation is now the highest it's been in um, the last 15 years. So as a campaign platform, um, Bolsonaro promised to do everything he could to support uh, increased mining and large scale farming, including explicitly campaigning for Latin dispossession. Um, I think I've gone too far, there we go. Um, so since the 1960s, the Federal Foundation for Indigenous Peoples or FUNAI has been responsible for treaty and land demarcations for indigenous people. And the 1988 constitution defined indigenous land rights and FUNAI's responsibilities to protect indigenous rights and autonomy. But on his very first day in office in 2019, Bolsonaro transferred the responsibility for demarcating indigenous land to the Ministry of Agriculture. This was overturned by Congress a few months later, and then Bolsonaro appoint, uh, responded by appointing a federal police officer representing agribusiness interests as the head of FUNAI. So what this tells us is that this kind of struggle for agroecology is really tied up in the struggle for land, and it's really tied up in the struggle for what kind of agriculture is made visible on the landscape and what kind of agriculture can contribute to feeding people, responding to climate change, and providing for livelihoods. So given this deep historical context and the incompatibility of interests across the state and civil society and agribusiness sectors, we've seen agrarian social movements begin to take a different tactic. But since the 1960s, agrarian social movements were firmly rooted in the politics of the countryside, land access, labor rights, environmental movements. But since the 1990s, and especially since the 1996 massacre of El Dorado de Carajas of, of, of that, um, murdered quite a few members of the Brazilian landless workers movement, there's been an explicit turn towards weaving together urban and rural peoples to jointly campaign for agroecology as an approach to food systems that addresses not just rural challenges, but the broader shared challenges of food security, food literacy, climate change, and biodiversity conservation. So Brazil experienced a rapid improvement in national food security as a result of the zero hunger and other social protection programs, such as the Bolsa Familia um, conditional cash transfer that began in the mid 1990s, and then were significantly strengthened and institutionalized under the Lula and early days of the Joma governments. By 2014, food insecurity had dropped by more than 80% from the decade prior. The Fomezero platform um, brought together agrarian reform and rural development strategies, together with strategies to address urban food security, food literacy, and public health. Institutional restructuring created parallel ministries of agriculture, agrarian development, and social development, and gave new roles for decentralized decision making around food policy at municipal, state, and national levels. One of the most exciting legacies of the heyday of the Fomezero. Uh, period was the policy embedding, <coughs> excuse me, and broader institu institutionalization of concepts of agroecology and food sovereignty, which had long been pushed by social movements such as the MST and the Via Campesina in Brazil. So the right to the the right to food movement, including the presentation of a constitutional amendment on the right to food, which was successfully passed in 2010 became more explicitly connected with rural movements for agrarian reform and food sovereignty, 
with the success, resulting in the successful insertion of food sovereignty language into the new uh, into new food discourses and policies. Uh, 2006 law on food security acknowledged that the realization of the human right to adequate food uh, requires respect for sovereignty. And another, for example, a decree upholding the food security law connects agroecology, food sovereignty, and food security. So we saw a rash of either new or updated policies during this Fome Zero period that contributed to the idea that agriculture has a social function to conserve the environment, to support rural livelihoods, and to provide healthy food for all Brazilians, not just for export. So this included land reform spending. Um, uh, there was not many new land reform settlements that got um, set up during the PT government, but they really spent a lot of money on improving rural infrastructure, roads, housing, value added facilities, as well as significant investments in educational facilities, including agroecological field schools, high schools, technical colleges, and the MST University, the Escola Nacional Flores and Fernandez. Agricultural credit programs were targeted to women, youth, and value, um, and value added in processing centers. And in 2009, an existing school feeding program um, moved to a targeted public procurement model, whereby 30% of school meal programs must be sourced from local family farmers with price premiums for uh, organic and agroecological production. So you really started to see an investment um, in moving resources to support different kinds of agriculture without at that time taking away resources from agribusiness. So there was kind of like a parallel pathway going on at this during this time. So the parallel pathway, because it hadn't actually shifted um, um, power dynamics at the institutional level, meant that that um, investment in agroecology, food sovereignty, and food security policy and programming was, was very fragile. So by 2015, the political and economic crisis in Brazil uh, resulted in a rapid withdrawal of support for a wide range of initiatives that had supported both the increase in social welfare and support for agroecological transitions in the countryside. So Sabrina and others have called this first uh, dismantling by default, so simply withdrawing funding um, from existing programs and policies. And then, you know, a more active dismantling occurred with policy changes, the criminalization and assassination of rural social movement leaders and environmental activists, and even lawsuits that crippled the public procurement program for small scale family farmers. For example, a number of lawsuits were filed against family farmers and cooperatives for delivering the wrong product to public procurement outlets. For example, cabbage instead of cabbage instead of lettuce was one of the common common cases, even though that was technically allowed under, under some some um, aspects of the public procurement policy. So Jen and I have written about kind of the deep bureaucratization of the public procurement policy um, that, that challenged the scaling of these, the, of these programs that looked so good on paper and that really corresponded with what social movements had been demanding for so many years. So between 15 and 2019 to sum up, we saw an almost complete starvation of acquisition of land for land redistribution. So no, no new settlements. Um, really saw the, the erasure of public food procurement programs through the PAA donation program and a lack of enforcement of the 30% rule in the school meal program. So family farmers lost a lot of their guaranteed markets. We saw a sharp drop in technical assistance programming for family farming and for land. And we also saw a, a ongoing drop in infrastructure investment in rural areas for family farming. So, these are just kind of a few stats. I'm certainly not going to read them all, but you can just see that you know we just saw a very rapid and very deep retrenchment. Um, other governance challenges include things like the forest code reform, which is kind of winding its way through application and enforcement, but really opened up more possibilities for deforestation and conversion of sensitive ecological areas. In 2016, we saw the um, the dismantling of the Ministry of Agrarian Development and some kind of consolidation of that programming within the Ministry of Agriculture, which further removed support for family and agroecological programs. Uh, the 2019 pension reform reduced support for rural workers and farmers. Um, 2019 also um, 
Bolsonaro did lots of things on his first day in office. Um, he also disbanded the National Council for Food Security and Sovereignty um, that has subsequently kind of limped along in a sort of reestablishment, but without um, designated civil society seats. And then there's been a widespread opening for uh, use of pesticides and other chemicals that had previously been uh, disallowed under the PT government. And on top of that, a global pandemic. So what you saw between 2015 and 2020 was kind of this shrinking of public support for alternative agriculture, but you didn't see a shrinking of rural demand for working on, on those topics. So we've kind of caught up to where we are today. Um, during COVID-19, um, up to 60% of Brazilians experienced food security over the last couple of years. 2021, many parts of Brazil saw the worst drought in 90 years, especially in the South. While the Northeast, as many of you probably saw in the news, um, experienced extremely serious flooding. Many, many municipalities have had a state of emergency this year. And then finally, there's um, active initiatives in Brazil to charge Bolsonaro for, for genocide. For uh, in, October, in October of last year, the Brazilian Congress prepared a recommendation to charge Bolsonaro with homicide, genocide, and crimes against humanity related to his failure to enact appropriate public measures to address the pandemic. And this despite him appointing his son to the committee, who was also charged. So this has been making its way now to the International Criminal Court in The Hague, where it arrived just yesterday. So you can see that there's this kind of context of crisis in which um, it might seem that there's kind of a paralysis in work for agroecological transitions. But what I'm gonna show you is that in fact, agroecology has become a banner of resistance because of the way in which agroecological networks in Brazil have engaged across the areas of social, political, and economic advocacy. So from here, I'm gonna to turn to look at how agroecological networks on the ground in Brazil are continuing to resist the breakdown of the Brazilian state and working to connect urban and rural people through solidarity networks. Um, so to sum up, uh, democratization processes were instrumental for starting to institutionalize agroecology in Brazil, both outside of the state movements uh, were democratizing land and the means of production well, within the state, uh, we saw increased access to public resources, knowledge, and policy-making spaces. And we also saw this connection of rural and urban people in the face of rapid urbanization and increasing consumer demand for healthy, sustainably produced food. So despite the challenges of the political coup, the climate crisis, and the crisis of COVID-19, grassroots organizations are using a wide range of tools to generate resistance through networks. For example, at the national scale, the National Agroecology Coalition, or ANA, is an umbrella organization that includes academics, social movements, farmer organizations, and other civil society groups. So in 2019, ANA developed a charter on land, territory, diversity, and struggle in conjunction with various political officials and representatives. And this charter affirms the coalition's commitment to rally and defend, and I quote, in defense of territories, land, water, seeds, public goods, culture, ways of life, and good living, in order to, quote, build a new project for the countryside, centering people, especially women, youth, and Black folks, land and territories, education, food sovereignty, cooperation, and agroecology. So that's a lot of concepts all tied up together, but what these networks are doing is trying to thread those previously somewhat distinct movements and networks into a, a network centered around the idea of, of good food, good life, good ecology, and good living. So for example, to kind of put that into place, the national meetings held by Anna, which I would say, you know, prior to the last few years has, has really been a, a, an organization characterized by, you know, post green revolution farmers who are kind of returning to agroecology from a, a perspective of, of, of social movement, mo traditional social movement mobil mobilization of compass of, 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 of um, farmers in Brazil. And they've, through this kind of articulation have started to create much more formalized relationships with indigenous communities who have a very different way of thinking about agriculture than, 
than um, many Brazilian other farmers do. So the agroecology movement in Brazil is, is expressly opening space uh, for indigenous leaders to play a more central role in discussions on agroecology. For example, Jacinta da Rosa and others are deepening discussions on how to move behind, beyond these kind of narrower conceptions of land as an you know, area of production. Lots of, of, of agroecology farmers call their farms unidades de produção, so they're, they're production units. That's even the, the idea of productivity is deeply embedded in the Brazilian um, small scale farming sector and sort of agri moving agroecology from just a different way of planting food to a different way of thinking about land has been a more recent pillar in kind of building out the agroecological network. Um, to resist a lot of the political challenges that are happening right now. So Jacinta de Rosa and others are, are deepening these discussions on how to move beyond narrower conceptions of land and food to consider indigenous knowledge and territory. And they're also demanding that settlers take action in support of uh, indigenous rights in light of the ongoing invasions of indigenous lands, which have dramatically increased since Bolsonaro came to power. So the fact that agrarian movements are now actively engaging with indigenous rights to territory in venues like Anna is uh, very significant considering the history of settler-led movements in Brazil. Um, so to foster, oops, so to foster the scaling up of agroecology, taking kind of these new new ways of thinking about land, network, and territory into account, um, taking agroecology as a social movement that connects rural and urban people. Uh, Hedge Covida, which is a member of the ANA Global um, or Brazilian National Agroecology Articulation. Hedge Covida is a member of, of ANA and is also one of the oldest and largest participatory guarantee agroecological cert certification networks in the world. It was constituted in the late 1990s as a decentralized network that organizes groups of family farmers and links them to regional networks of farmer support organizations. Sapagro would be one of the regional networks. And they also link um, these farmers to consumer cooperatives and kind of um, uh, marketing opportunities. And so the decentralized, the decentralized networks enable kind of multiple dynamics of interaction between different kinds of farmers. So against farmers who are belong to different commodity groups, farmers who belong to different social movements, and farmers at various stages of transition from conventional to agroecological agriculture. And that's one of the things that makes this network so different. It's not, it's 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 providing a space for different kinds of diverse approaches to growing and sharing food to work with each other rather than in competition with each other. So concerns, so some of the shared values that, that, that bring these different movements and groups together in Hegeco Vida include concerns about the impacts of agrochemical use on environmental and human health, which is a strong motivating force for farmers in the Ecovida network. Uh, diversification practices that support the reduction of synthetic inputs, including agroforestry, legumes, cover crops, um, are used and kind of debated by participating farmers. Um, uh, Ecovita farmers also share knowledge with each other about diversification practices, and they uh, work on kind of building seed sovereignty and, and, and sharing seeds with each other to be able to move beyond the domination of the seed market in Brazil by multinational corporations. So today there's approximately 5,000 farmers in this network organized in more than 300 regional groups across Brazil. And more than 20 different social movements and non-governmental organizations are part of the Ecovida network. So increasingly, um, uh, on the ground examples can be found where new indigenous settler relationships are being formed through um, agroecological networks. So Sapagro, for example, has a partnership with the local Guarani aldea or community to support uh, agroecological practices, seed sovereignty, biocultural heritage, uh, programming, and youth activism. And alliance building efforts such as these do indicate the potential for the development of shared agroecological institutions based in reciprocity, solidarity, fairness, and a respect for diversity. So Zapagro's work also bridges the rural urban gap, bringing the threads of agroecological resistance into the city. 
So they support a wide range of activities with diverse kinds of farmers. For example, they've worked with farmers who for several, genera several generations have been working in the tobacco industry to diversify their production systems. And these farmers are now transitioning to fruit and horticulture, connecting to local different kinds of different markets. And they're also working with social movements such as the MST on political advocacy and media training. Support, they support new farmers, including urban people returning to the countryside after other careers. So again, kind of having a, a multiple pathways of entry into an agroecological movement that's not, that, that moves away from kind of a traditional intergenerational um, land transfer within families. So in the city, uh, much of this work, political work takes place um, through experiential learning activities such as urban gardening workshops, where political advocacy takes place alongside more practical details such as implementing urban composting systems and food recovery and redistribution networks. And it also occurs in the context of alternative market arrangements, including CSAs, public procurement contracts, and urban farmers market networks. So again, the diversity of spaces in which the agroecological movement finds itself contributes to um, building the kind of solidarity that has enabled uh, these networks to provide mutual support to many, many people in the face of food crises, especially in the context of the pandemic. So you'll see lots and lots of food recovery programs. You'll see lots and lots of um, food bank engagement from by agroecological movements and a lot of work um, getting urban people involved in moving food from one place to another as, as needs have emerged. For example, um, just over the holidays, um, these uh, very significant floods in Northeast Brazil, and you saw a lot of, um, of the agroecology um, nucleos or, or, or sub organizations getting involved in flood response activities. These are just some examples of kind of the social media that's 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 going around and, and really providing opportunities for urban people in particular to come out and, and, and support um, cleanup. So to sum up, we've been discussing the role of agroecological networks in contributing to social and ecological transitions in Brazil, even in the face of very, very serious political challenges over the last several years. So we see movement in two directions. Many farms are moving away from diversification as their, their lands are getting incorporated into industrial agriculture. And we see movement in the other direction where farmers are transitioning to diversified farming systems, they're, they're, they're joining agroecological networks or they're starting new peri-urban farms that are um, diversified. And so in this dynamic, we see constraints and trade-offs between livelihoods, market access, biodiversity and yield outcomes and constraints due to farm size, land tenure, subsidies, uh, many, other, many other constraints. And so coming back to kind of our work as agroecologists to better understand and understand uh, to better understand and address these trade offs. We want to be able to do so in a more agile fashion to reach both farmers and policymakers and agroecological farmers want to see their practices recognized. So I'll close um, this talk with an example of something quite practical um, so we can have a much longer debate and maybe we could do this in the Q and a about whether the struggle for agroecological agro recognition is a question of politics or a question of maybe data that is missing and required for evidence-based policymaking. And there's a lot of debate on this point in the FAO and other spaces that we're, that we're, that we're working in. Uh, current platforms for assessing agroecological performance at any scale, really local to global, are often based on data that's collected sporadically over a long period of time. So the world census for agriculture, for example, only happens once every decade. These initiatives don't usually involve farmers or traditional knowledge keepers in the process, or they don't include questions that could more um, accurately identify the diverse array of context specific management practices present across global agroecological systems. On the other side of the methodological spectrum, ethnographies and case studies adopting methods from the social sciences, where I come from, have often been used to study agroecology and to account for kind of context specificity at the community and regional levels. Um, most of these case studies aren't designed for comparison or monitoring over time. Um, 
And then lastly, a lot of indicator work, research, this is very time consuming and costly for both researchers and farmers, and particularly for farmer networks like Hedge Covita, who often find themselves kind of fielding research requests from not just my students, but many, many, many students. So not many of those students return the results to farmers either. So very few of the kind of tools for documenting agroecology and communicating it externally are accessible to farmers themselves to use autonomously in the documentation and assessment of their own management practices. So the digitalization of agriculture and the approach um, kind of, of what we call human-centered design provides a potential pathway through which to ensure <laughs> that farmers can co-create their own um, farm assessments and communication opportunities, and that those results can originate and stay in the hands of farmers themselves. So since 2018, I've been working with Sopagro and the participatory guarantee network that they coordinate on expanding the toolbox for farmer-driven monitoring methods for agroecology. We've been trialing a grassroots designed open access software created by one of our former postdocs at UBC, Azia Maravi. And we've developed this over the last several years with input from many, many farmers across this agroecological participatory guarantee network that I mentioned. And so this responds to farmers telling us that they want support for their own internal livelihood analysis for their for sustainability reporting and certification and to protect their own data sovereignty. So they want to be able to craft their own data stories and contribute to sharing the outputs of their farms, ecological, social, and academic activities with people that they've chosen to share them with without having that need to be mediated by a researcher or, a, or an, external, an external partner. So here's a few pictures of the farmer research team. Here's just an example of some of the indicators that the software can report on. Um, here's a few pictures of the farmer research team teams in Brazil last year, trialing the software as part of just their regular their participatory guarantee certification visits with Sapago. Um, I think they found it um, interesting and challenging. So we've, there's a lot of desire for different ways of, of, of creating software. And so we're all learning a lot about how, how to do that. Um, uh, much to our surprise, the software has kind of gotten out there as an open access tool, and we've had more than 2,000 people try it in the last year in more than 80 countries, which really surprised us. <laughs> but um, so there is a demand for this kind of like citizen driven agroecological monitoring that is not mediated by you know, an external party. So in conclusion, I've talked a lot. Um, Brazil has been a global leader both in challenges to agroecology with the power of agribusiness leading to violence and degradation <clears throat> and in pathways to agroecological transitions through social movement mobilization, through land reform, through agroecological networks, <clears throat> and for new methods for certification such as participatory guarantee systems. Despite the challenges of the last few years, these networks are alive, visible, and mobilized through social media and on the ground. They are fighting the disinformation fight and they are engaging on all fronts of environmental and social policy. They have contributed to creating a collective identity that um, has created visibility for rural and urban solidarity. They've connected um, what we call bringing the city to the country. They've contributed to relations gesturing towards decolonization and new agrarianisms. And they've also resulted in um, still continued policy advocacy for alternative economies that include um, market infrastructure um, and the, the networks that we've been talking about. So will things change if Lula comes to power? This, uh, there's a lot of skepticism about this. He's ahead in the polls, but um, I think there's a lot of, of things planted on the ground that could pick up again the possibilities for agroecology to have a greater scaling out in Brazil and for that to have beneficial political, social, and ecological dynamics um, that connect rural and urban people. So I will stop there and hopefully there will be some questions and some comments that we can discuss. So thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Anna, for an excellent talk. That was really fascinating. So we have until 4 p.m., at least 15 minutes for discussion. Um, I will moderate the Q&A so Hannah doesn't have to keep track of chat or hands. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question, please feel free to raise your hand and I'll call on you or you can write it in the chat and we'll read it for Hannah. Um, and maybe I'll just ask you something because I don't see anything right away, which is if you could just say a little bit more, Hannah, about land reform, <laughs> like you, which you touched on, but yeah. what, what do you see as the role of land reform either currently or post Bolsonaro? Like what's, what do you see as feasible paths forward there and or tension with land grabs that are occurring in Brazil? I mean, this is like, this is the question that we had, you know, through the early 2000s, an actual implementation of constitutional law, which is when land is being used um, in a way that is environmentally degrading, does not respect labor laws and is um, held speculatively, which is kind of the kind of constitutional criteria for land expropriation. If those conditions could be shown, then the state could expropriate that land and return it to landless farmers. And so you had quite, um, especially in the late 90s up into the early 2000s, quite a lot of land distributed in Brazil. And you have this kind of um, vast social movement mobilization. A lot of that has been retrenched by industrial agriculture actually taking over the land that was previously distributed and also taking over indigenous land. And so, you know, if, if, if the public sector is not going to enforce the existing laws, that's we're in a we're in a state of dysfunction at the moment. Where, um, as far as colonization um, settlements, the laws, as far as I can keep track, haven't really changed. They're just not they're just not funding them to to be enacted. And then, as on the indigenous demarcation. Um, front, there is actually um, policy changes being put into place. So um, the, he, try, he, he tried to get, away, get rid of the indigenous um, FUNAI agency altogether, that failed. So then he moved, the, the process for demarcating indigenous land was moved into the Ministry of Agriculture. So there's been changes in, in who gets to say that are illegal, but they're going forward. And so, you know, one of the, the, the challenges on kind of the deforestation front is there's complete impunity. So even though it's Ill, still illegal to deforest your, um, your legal reserve area of your farm, there's no consequence for that anymore. And so there's just been a complete dismantling of the, Kind of environmental governance apparatus, and I think Susanna Hecht is going to talk a lot of more, a lot more about that in her talk. But all of that is happening at the same time as you have, you know, these agroecological work networks kind of digging in and saying, "Well, we're we're just trying to survive and expand." At the same time as like people are being violently dispossessed around the edges, so it's quite fraught. Anyone want to ask a question? Mm -hmm. I do. I have, let me pose a few, at least a couple questions. <laughs> um, one, I'm, I just put it in the chat. I'm curious about uh, what Consea is doing right now. I got to go to one of their, their national meetings and it was one of the most inspiring participatory approaches I'd ever seen in my life. Um, thousands of people together making decisions. It's remarkable how they did it. Um, especially that was when they had all the civil society actors that were part of it. So I'm just curious to know more about what's happened with Consea. And another kind of quick question is, I think you, you mentioned that there's, you see kind of a bifurcation. There are still some farmers that are moving towards biodiverse agroecological practices, but others that are moving away. Is, is that, is that just all small farmers or is, is the system in Brazil similar to the US where we're, we keep me, losing the middle of the, the side, you know, middle-sized farmers? Is it the large ones that are moving away, continuing to 
move towards kind of a monocropped approach and the smaller ones that are taking up agroecology? Or are you just specifically focusing on small scale farmers in that comment you made? Yeah, I, I can definitely respond to the second question. The, the first one about Conseya, to be honest, it's been hard to keep up with. <laughs> so when, when Bolsonaro came into office, he got rid of Conseya altogether. And then there was lots of back and forth. And then my understanding is there was kind of some kind of advisory body reconstituted, but it, they lost the civil society seats. And and there's been no there's been no space for Conseil to to be able to do anything in the current context. So you know the government's basically shut down from COVID. I the Conseil members that I knew and sort of engaged with, they're still doing research. So they're the ones doing the the food security um, research and showing the impact of the pandemic and showing the impact of what's happening when you withdraw support for the public food procurement programs and what's happening with nutrition in schools and all those things. So, you know, there was, there was a bunch of stuff that was happening even like through 2018, 2019, like Brazil came out with a new, um, what do you call it, dietary guidelines. And, you know, the Brazilian dietary guidelines are like fantastic. And they, you know, one of the dietary guidelines is to eat with people. You know, it's just like globally leading um, work. And so, you know, some of that, you have people still carrying it forward in their organizational capacities. Conseil was always comprised of people from organizations and those organizations have not been erased. Um, so I don't know what exactly right now, January 2022 is Conseil's status. I would have to look into that. But my my sense is that the organizations that comprised it are still doing their work. And, you know, it's all is not lost. Like this, this the, the thing about networked movements rather than like single issue movements is that they're, they're stronger. If, they're, they're, if their single issue gets cut off, they're not, they're not erased. Um, on the farm size question, that's like really interesting. I have a PhD student um, that Jen's actually on her committee and she's defending her thesis um, next Monday. And one of her chapters looked at the 5,000 members of Hedji Govida and tried to see if farm size, you know, was there a big difference in ag agroecological practices across the dimensions of farm size on their farms? Because there are there's a wide range of farm sizes within Hedge Govida, including a lot of, of, of large farms. And what she found is that in the Hedge Govida network, um, farm size didn't really matter. Whereas we know from broader research globally that there has been shown to be, um, there's tended to be a correlation between your size of farm and your use of agro, agroecological practices. And that's an inverse relationship. The smaller your farm, the, the more diverse you, you, you might be. And she found that that relationship did not hold tr true for the Hedge Govita farmers. And so the hypothesis there is it's, it's about the social network. It's about um, having support for learning how to do agroecology given your farm's context, even if your farm is a large farm. And so what you see in a lot of the larger farmers is you see like agroforestry systems, you see more diversified crop rotations, you see mixed crop livestock farms. And so, you know, what you can, if you're gonna scale up agroecology, it doesn't just mean 50 acres of mixed veg instead of one acre of mixed veg, it might mean like different kinds of landscape configuration. And so that's actually one of the things that's one of our research goals with the light farm network is that if we can get enough farmers just to characterize their own farms and get a better sense of like the landscape composition across like farm size gradients and then look at agroecological practices that farmers are documenting, we hope to be able to start to answer some of those questions um, more closely. Just a quick follow up to that your, with your last point is, is that um, that online app, or I don't know what you call it, <laughs> the the way that it's an app. Yep, <laughs> an app. Okay, um, is it is it in multiple languages? Is that how it's being picked up all yeah. around the world? Like, I'd love to share it with friends of mine. Yeah. So right now it's available in Spanish, Portuguese, and English, and then in April the French version will come out, and then 
because it's open access and open source, there's a very clear kind of like process. If, if people want to have it translated into other languages, they can like arrange to have that done. And then it can be, it, it kind of recognizes where you are geographically and then kind of like loads in that language. And then you could change it if you want. Very yeah, cool. we because our pilot project is with this Latin American network, we were able to, to launch it in the three languages from the get-go and then starting to work with the others now. Hmm. Yeah, and it's free. Awesome. Um, so Emily's had a question. Are there different spatial locations where agribusiness and agricultural networks are dominant or do they coexist throughout the Brazil? This I is, mean, it's sort of like the more vet meta version of, of the farm size question, right? Like yeah. beyond the small landscape, like in terms of, yeah, where different types of policies are enacted, right? There are frontiers where agribusiness tends to be dominant, yeah. but I, I'm not really aware of how the, how the networks play in in those types of spaces or if they do. You know, I think, I think you could argue it both ways. Like what the work we did in Mato Grosso, which is like the most, at the time that Jen and I were working in Mato Grosso, it was like super dominated by agribusiness. And yet there were still agroecological networks working in Mato Grosso. And so there would be like these pockets of, you know, it would be a land reform settlement or it'd be a municipal food policy council that would set up a farmer's market. And there would be like these points of entry to start like lighting a small flame of agroecology and then that could spread. And so I think we can talk about regional dominance of certain kinds of practices over others. You know, there's like, there's a higher incidence of farms using agroecological practices in Southern Brazil compared to like central Brazil. And then if you look in the Amazon region, you have kind of more agroforestry, but then you also have more ranching. And if you go to Northeast, you'll have more like sugar cane plantations, but you also have a lot of agroforestry systems around like the cacao, cacao and kind of fruit, fruit farms. So, you know, if we think about the network as, as, as covering all of Brazil and then farmers finding those pathways, one of the big um, kind of successes of, of the last few years has just been this ability for farmers to communicate with each other in a way that they weren't able to before. So the WhatsApp networks and the, the kind of social media and the, the, the slow but increasing rollout of internet and band, you know, bandwidth and cell, cell phone access in the rural areas has really contributed to people being able to try more things and to have more support than they had before. And so that's one of the ways that I think you're seeing more foray into this agroecological movement despite you know all of the challenges that that we see i'm not trying to like romanticize the agricultural movement like it's a very serious problem and people especially if they're working in frontier areas can be in danger is it um you know from violence but there also are ways for them to get supported with those movements i'm not sure if that answers your question but we see some bright spots you we know, just have a, in these very difficult frontier dynamics. We only have a couple of minutes left, left, and I saw that Jess had her hand raised, and there's one in the chat. Jess, do you still have your question, or um, I think maybe we can squeeze in two and go a minute or so over. So go ahead, Jess, and then I'll read thank, it. In the chat. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's it's really amazing to hear from you. Um, my question is kind of considering responses that you already gave to both um, Jennifer and Leslie's earlier questions. Um, and I'm just wondering what you see as the most resilient mechanisms to support this agroecological transition really grounded in expressions of food, political, bodily autonomy. Um, I feel like before I would have thought it would be institutionalized, you know, land tenure protection doesn't seem to be that way. Is it movement building? Is it civil society coalitions? Um, what do you see as the, the, the best thing for us to be supporting at the moment? So, you know, one of the things that we've been researching in Brazil the last several years, and I had a PhD student do his thesis on this, was, was bringing kind of urban people into the agroecology movement. And if you think about a country like Brazil, it's, I think it's over 80% urbanized now. You know, that's a lot of people who are not growing their own food, who, 
who need to get their food from somewhere. And so Brazil has this incredible capacity for urban people to get involved in agroecology. And we're seeing that happen. We're seeing it happen through like municipal food policy councils. We're seeing it through um, NGOs and kind of consumer cooperatives in urban areas. And if they can create a market, a guaranteed market for farmers who are in transitioning um, situations, we've, def we've seen examples where urban people have bought land and are hiring farmers to farm it agroecologically. We've, we've, We've seen um, rural cooperatives emerge where um, urban people buy land and then they, they farm it together on the weekends. And so we're, I think we're seeing this all of a sudden urban people realizing that they actually do have a say in how, how, how food is grown and they can contribute to that. They're, they don't just have to have a relationship with the supermarket. And so I think that seeing that happen has been really inspiring and then figuring out um, how to maintain or install relations of equity where they where they didn't previously exist. Um, you know, there's starting to be talk about rural wages and, and paying the full price of food and that kind of thing. Um, at the same time, you have rural people coming and bringing food to people in the city who are starving. So we have like people donating, rural people donating food to hungry urban people. And so creating those kind of relationships of solidarity that go in both directions, I think has been really important for, for building those networks. And then well, John's question, yeah, um, large farms a using economy. scale. Um, so are there agroecological farms tapping into economies of scale or ways in which they're doing that? Or is that reserved for commodity production? I feel like you started to touch on it with the cooperative angle. But. Curious if you have other thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it just depends on what you're talking about economies of scale. Like, you know, one of the ways that the, the movements that I've worked with have, have functioned is they coordinate their marketing. So, you know, there might be 20 farms delivering to a city, but they have one truck. And so they will hire somebody to, so instead of each individually selling to a middleman or, or to a wholesaler, they're basically selling to themselves and, 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 you know, hiring somebody to take the bulk to market. And so they're becoming kind of their own wholesalers in that sense. And so that's been a way to, to keep more of the profit and to, you know, a lot of these farmers don't have enough to fill a school feeding contract, but together they do. That, you know, there's a, again, a transaction cost to that and like needing to figure out what is an appropriate pricing structure to be able to pay a community member. How do you get enough money to buy the refrigerated truck in the first place? Um, you know, during that kind of 2009 to 20, 2013 kind of heyday, there was a lot of grants for infrastructure like cooperatives being able to buy refrigerated trucks or being able to build um, cold storage facilities that facilitated, facilitated those economies of scale. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's the where, where it's going. That's the way it's going here in Canada the same. I mean, you, you see people um, a lot of farms where I live, they're moving away from the farmer's market and moving more towards like CSA or like, um, you know, co-wholesaling co to, because it's just like showing up at three farmer's markets a week, just, it's not profitable anymore, right? Especially when in COVID people aren't going to the farmer's market. So I think you're seeing like more ways of farmers collaborating with each other to create those distribution networks rather than competing with each other. And that's, that's allowing more food to get to cities at an affordable price that still allows farmers to have a livelihood. Well, I'd like to thank one more time the organizers of this mini series and our co-sponsors, and then especially Hannah, thank you for generously sharing your time with us today. We really appreciate your, your insights and, and great talk. Um, and thanks to the audience for your participation and questions. And, and we'll end it there. I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thanks for having me. Nice Bye to everyone. see everyone. Good to see you.